What is this thing and why is it crushing my arm? Well, it's a blood pressure cuff and this slightly uncomfortable squeezing is just how it takes a measurement. So why are the numbers this thing spits out important for your health? And is while doing the intro to a YouTube video a good time to take a measurement? I also want to talk about another potentially important number you might have heard fitness geeks talking about online, heart rate variability or HRV. So what do these values mean for your fitness, heart health, and even how long you might live? To find out, I decided to get some help from cardiologist and YouTuber, Dr. Rohin Francis. And let's start with a simple question. What is blood pressure? Blood pressure is uh, essentially the, the, the pressure inside your arteries. So the heart squeezes and as it pumps, blood goes around the body and that's called the systolic phase of the cardiac cycle. So you get a, a pressure going up like this. And then as it relaxes, um, the pressure drops, but obviously it doesn't drop to zero because it's still a pressurized system. But then the lower number is the diastolic phase. So, that, so you've got the systolic as the top number and diastolic as the bottom number. And a healthy blood pressure is normally described as 120 over 80. So the commonly quoted normal blood pressure is 120 over 80, though some healthy people can measure a bit lower than that. It's when blood pressure starts to creep above 120 over 80 that we run into problems. But why is high blood pressure bad for us? So blood pressure is an extremely important measurement, and this um, comes out of Framingham landmark study in card cardiology, a longitudinal study following up lots of people. And this is what identified a lot of the risk factors that we, we know about for heart disease, like high cholesterol and high blood pressure emerges as one of them. And th the reason is, is that uh, high blood pressure reflects the fact that your arteries are becoming less elastic. They're becoming stiff. And that's what happens as we get older. And this leads to kidney damage, heart damage, uh, damage to your eyes. Uh, what do these things have in common? Um, very small blood vessels. So it tends to, you know, if you're having elevated pressure in, in vessels that aren't designed to handle this pressure, you're going to get uh, damage, you're going to get little hemorrhage, bleeding in these in these areas, and these organs will start to, to, um, to fail eventually. The damage that high blood pressure causes is cumulative. Every year you live with it, more tiny blood vessels will break. And that's why it's never too early to start keeping an eye on your blood pressure, and never too late to start trying to improve it. If you're regularly getting readings above 120 over 80, there's plenty you can try. Eating more fruit and veg, cutting back on salt and alcohol, and getting more exercise are all great places to start. And if you're regularly getting readings of 140 over 90 or more, it might be worth discussing this with your doctor, if they don't already know, and considering starting on medication. Above 115 over 75, every 20 over 10 increase roughly doubles your risk of heart disease or stroke. So 135 over 85 is twice the risk, 155 over 95 is four times the risk, and so on. So by making you aware if your numbers run a little bit high, this humble little device could save your life. And high blood pressure is a silent killer. Globally, 40% of people over the age of 25 suffer from it. But the problem is, it hasn't got any immediate symptoms. You can't feel if you've got high blood pressure. So that's why it's worth grabbing a blood pressure cuff and seeing what's going on inside your circulatory system. The problem is, is that measuring blood pressure is pretty hard. And I'm sure everybody knows the way we normally do that is with a, a cuff that inflates. And it's quite painful. It, you know, it inflates because it has to go above the top number. It has to go above your blood pressure to then deflate. It's annoying. No one's going to tolerate having that being done all the time. So some devices have come out sort of trying to measure this from the wrist in different ways and all kinds of different algorithms. But so far, to me, it seems like the, the, the kind of holy grail. It's, it's, it's not, we're, we're not, we're not there yet. And that's an interesting question in terms of the continuous monitoring as well. Because again, if you look at the, the sort of clinical studies that have looked at this, this is again done in the doctor's office. Um, there's this phenomenon, white coat hypertension. I suffer from terrible white coat hypertension. Mm. My heart rate and my, my blood pressure go right up. How are you feeling right now? <laughs> I'm in the, in the presence of a doctor. <laughs> terrible. Oh my God. 
Um, and what's what's really interesting is comparing your perhaps your blood pressure while you're exercising. So I've got a blood pressure cuff that I tried to wear while cycling, mm. and my my systolic blood pressure, the big number, was 160 something. And of course, that's probably normal. Yeah. But I've just got no idea what these long-term measurements would actually mean. No, and, and we don't really have much data at all in, of true continuous blood pressure monitoring. Because to do that, you need to have a line in your artery. Uh, there's uh, Non-invasive blood pressure, by definition, is just a, a spot, uh, a snapshot, because you have to do that whole inflation, deflation process. So the only way to tr truly measure continuous blood pressure is, is by putting a line into an artery in the leg or the arm. And this, this is what I do when I do procedures, but obviously I'm doing that uh, on patients who are sick. You know, I'm not, uh, and and we, we have done short-term measurements of, of healthy volunteers, um, but we have no data long-term. It would be completely unethical uh, to, to, to expose somebody to the risks of having an invasive line in uh, 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 something that can just pop out and bleed profusely for, for any period of time. And especially during exercise. I don't want to be running along. Now, this is where reading the historical medical uh, journals is always great fun. They put arterial lines in weightlifters um, and, <laughs> oh my God. and measured uh, their blood pressure during a deadlift. What Now, so we've, we've said the uh, you know definition of hypertension is more than 135, 140. You got up to 160 something. Uh, a, a giraffe, which we think is, the, you know, the highest blood pressure in the animal kingdom. I mean, it's got to get the blood all the way up to the exactly. top of the head, presumably. Exactly. So we, we've, we've, I love these these papers, you know, um, where they've, they've measured giraffe um, blood pressure. I think it was about 310 systolic uh, was a uh, giraffe blood pressure. What do you think the blood pressure recorded in a weightlifter doing a deadlift was? Tr transiently, you know, just for the deadlift. I'm going to say 400. Yeah, it was over 400. Wow. It was 435, I think. That's incredible. Um, and you can imagine it, like watching their veins strain. Well, as I they mean, lift those there are lots of videos online of, of deadlifters, you know, just passing out after. <laughs> so, it, 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 you know, I, I wouldn't uh, advise Eddie Hall deadlifting a car kind of <laughs> level, but weight training is, is good. You just don't have to go crazy. Um, uh, so, yes, the body uh, can handle short term, you know, spikes like that. I, I think at that extent, it, it, you can do a lot of damage. But you're you measuring 160 during exercise. That's nothing to worry about at all. And also, uh, this is one of the nice things about exercise uh, and blood pressure is immediately you can see the benefit. Some of the uh, benefits of exercise uh, uh, take a bit longer, but uh, blood pressure, while it'll spike, like in your case, straight away after you, you get a, a, a drop in blood pressure. And this is um, because you've got a release of uh, nitric oxide in, in the body, which is uh, this uh, chemical that opens up your blood vessels. And, and we administer nitrates in, in patients who have circulation problems. Um, but you can, you know, have your own endogenous supply. And um, so you get an immediate benefit post-exercise of all your blood uh, vessels having opened up and a, a nice drop in blood pressure, which is why it is one of the most important treatments for, for high blood pressure. So this is one case where it's totally okay to get high on your own supply, or get low, since we're talking about blood pressure, I guess. So blood pressure is an absolute classic medical measurement used by doctors for decades, and with loads of high quality evidence telling us how important it can be for your health. So now we're gonna move straight to the other end of the fitness data fashion spectrum and look at an up and coming new kid on the block when it comes to health monitoring, heart rate variability, or HRV. So what is it? And why is it important? Put simply, heart rate variability is the variation in the gap between heartbeats. So you might think that the heart just sort of beats like a metronome constantly, but actually in a healthy heart, you get this slight variation in the gap between each heartbeat. It seems counterintuitive, but uh, you, know, you, might, you might think a regular heartbeat is good, but actually a variation uh, seems to have a prognostic benefit. So it seems to be a marker of good health. And this came out of continuous heart rate uh, recordings um, after patients had had heart attacks. And this, I think, is going back way into the 70s or 80s. And it was found that the heart rate variability decreased. And these patients did worse. And then the same thing was noted in patients with heart failure, when the, the heart's not pumping as strongly as it should be. 
they also had reduced heart rate variability. And over sub subsequent years, we've noticed it in many disease states, poorly controlled diabetes, high blood pressure, um, respiratory disease, um, all are associated with a reduction in heart rate variability. What is slightly less clear is whether it can also be a marker in, in non-pathological states. So if you don't have any of these diseases and you're just healthy, whether tracking your heart rate variability um, is, is something you should be doing. The best slightly hand-waving explanation I've heard as to why higher variability is good is because it shows that your heart is highly adaptable to changing circumstances, rather than being in a stressed out, non-adaptable state. And this could plausibly be important for your health, because your heart rate needs to change all the time for loads of different reasons, as your activity level varies throughout the day. Your heart rate even changes slightly, depending on whether you're breathing in or breathing out. So clearly that ability to adapt to changing circumstances could be pretty important. One application of heart rate variability, which uh, is of interest to, I think, a lot of athletes, uh, and it's, it seems to be picking up in its popularity, is using heart rate variability uh, less as a sort of um, long-term thing to track, but also to inform uh, regarding recovery. This is where we start crossing into a, a little bit of hocus pocus, but Heart rate variability can, um, you know, the different devices will, will have different ways of doing it, but they, they typically will say bad, medium, good kind of um, uh, ranking. And if your heart rate variability is good, suggesting you've you've had a good sleep and um, you are in a good state uh, to be doing something strenuous because your powers of recovery will be good. And then I've often heard people say oh, you know, I, I, I looked at my device and it said that uh, my, my HRV was, was in the, the red zone today, so I'm not going to do any exercise. Um, and this was reflective of, you know, my, my sleep pattern last night. And I'm like, oh, okay, that's, that's fine. But, you know, if I've had a bad sleep, I kind of know I've had a bad sleep. Right? I don't know if I need a heart rate variability to tell me that. And... Um, other people have said, well, I, I noticed my heart rate variability and my sleep quality really deteriorate when I've had a few drinks before bed. I'm like, yeah, I, I think I could have told you that as well. You know, <laughs> like, I don't know that we, I think, I, I feel like we sometimes over-medicalize some of just common intuition, common sense things. Um, but yes, there seems to be uh, interest in sporting circles and that clearly inevitably crosses into more general wellness. But I would always take anything that elite athletes do for their health with not just a pinch, but a shovel of salt. It's gonna be uh, terrible for your blood pressure. Bad for your blood pressure. <laughs> but, um... Since getting a smartwatch a few years ago, I've been surprised by how fast my resting heart rate can change. Like it can improve from week to week if I do more exercise. But HRV could provide even more rapid feedback. And that could be quite useful. But it's also true that we just don't have great evidence on what the short or long-term implications of HRV changes might be compared to other measures. We are really very sure that having a lower resting heart rate or lower blood pressure is an indication that you'll live longer in better health. But we just don't know if the same is true of basically healthy people with a better HRV. So heart rate variability might be an interesting thing to track to see if it improves if you change your lifestyle or health habits. But most importantly, it's something researchers should look into now it's so easy and cheap to fit people with devices that can measure it 24-7. Thanks again to Rohin for sitting down with me to chat about blood pressure, elite athlete mumbo jumbo, and giraffes. And this is actually the third video based on our conversation. If you want to find out more about resting heart rate, VO2 max, step counting, and exercise, check out this on the most important number for your health. And this is also the fifth video in my series on wearables. So be smart, watch the rest of the series here. And for more on wearables, health, aging biology, AI, and occasional terrible puns, Here's a subscribe button. Go on, give it a click. I'll just leave it there. <laughs>